What's going on, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Eat, Speak, Compete, the podcast where we talk about everything going on in the esports and gaming space every single week. My name is Yeso. I'm your host as always, joined by my co-host Luke Shimoni Hebrew here for episode number 13. We've got a ton to talk about today. Big news in League of Legends free agency, some more arcane spoilers as well as some big smash news. But we're starting off today with a very special guest. He is one of the hottest casters in the Halo space right now. He is a forerunner for Halo Infinite. We'll talk about that with him here today. His name is Shyway joining us on the show. Uh, Shyway, welcome. Happy to have you, my man. How are we doing? I'm good, man. Happy to be here. You, you, you said, what did you say, the hottest caster? I, I, it's wild I'm just one to of think the that, hottest. That that's what, I, that's what I heard. One of the hottest. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's all happening so quick, man. Uh, but I, you know, I'm still I think very new to this. But it's it's just, it's such an exciting time. It's so great to see all the hype coming to Halo, uh, and great to be on the show. How are you guys doing? We're doing great. You know, it's it was pretty exciting when you were like, yeah, let's screw it. I'll come on the podcast. You know, this, <laughs> I shot Shyway a note uh, like late last night, and I was like, yeah, if we're gonna talk tomorrow and you're around, why don't you just jump on the podcast? He's you you've just been all over my timeline, whether it be with the the forerunner news, all of your different like map breakdowns, tips and tricks, and then of course, sure. you know, hitting 30k on YouTube. Congratulations on that end. Um, you know, it's it's just super Thank exciting you. to see you continue to glow up, if you will, um, through the uh, the hard work that you've put into the Halo scene. The far and now with a brand new title coming out uh it just felt too uh too perfect not to you know jump on the jump on the podcast and have a little chat around just all the all the honestly incredible stuff that you've been working on over these last two years thank you i uh, happy to share as much as i can I, I know you guys brought up the forerunner thing too feel free to just hit me with questions i'll i'll, I'll do what i can <laughs> but uh but you know happy to be here happy to talk about it all so uh obviously we are going to talk about infinite and all that stuff but i want to kind of Go back to the beginning here. Uh, I actually was watching, you know, I was jumping in your stream yesterday as we were uh, watching the Xbox and Halo anniversary together. Uh, and you shared a little bit about kind of where you got your start in Halo. You talked about getting uh, an Xbox very late, actually, uh, in, in that console generation to play Halo 2 with your brother. Talk to me a little bit about how you got started uh, with Halo and kind of where everything began before, you know, obviously coming to now casting, working all these events, being a part of Halo Infinite. Right. Man, uh, okay, where to start? I've, so I've been I've been a gamer all my life. I've been a, a huge gamer since I was I want to say five six years old. Uh, Nintendo sixty four was my first like owned console with Mario sixty four. That was definitely a as a life highlight for sure. Uh, just getting into the gaming uh, with Halo though. I so I, I first got to try Halo on my buddy's Xbox. Uh, I had this one buddy had all the consoles. I would always go to his house. He would show me new games every time. And one day. He showed me Halo CE, and we played uh, the cartographer, and it just it, it changed my world, man. Being being in that open environment and just cruising around on the Warthog, something about it was just it was so different than anything I'd ever played. Uh, when I eventually, when I later got to play Halo Two uh, at these LAN parties, he'd do these birthday parties, and he'd have every, you know twelve to sixteen people over, and uh, and we'd set up like a big LAN party for Halo Two. That's when I really got into it. That's when when I was like, okay, I need an Xbox ASAP. <laughs> I, I bought a secondhand Xbox uh, off a of buddy, and it was late. It would have been like 2004, 2005 when I finally ended up getting that Xbox. Uh, but I just, yeah, I had to do it. I, I got it. I played uh, as much Halo 2 as I could. A lot of campaign because I was kind of so late to the window with online. I didn't really get to play it. Uh, but a lot of campaign with my brother. And, uh, and then when 3 came out, uh, back in, it would have been 2007, I finally got the 360. I played Halo 3, played some online multiplayer. Uh, I was a casual for a long time. I jumped around on a bunch of different games. So I, I wasn't a Halo hardcore. I, I'm not boasting 50s, you know, Halo 3, Halo 2 <laughs> for sure. Uh, I, I bounced around a little bit. I played some Gears of War. I jumped over to Smash Bros. And then I came back to Halo for Halo 5 because just something about the gameplay, it sucked me in, the movement, the mechanics. I, I'm a sucker for that stuff. So I... I came back with Halo 5, and uh, and thankfully I, I had a lot of other things I was doing, uh, you know, commentary in the gaming space, and it just so happened that it aligned with my passion for Halo 5, and things just kind of got started there. So I'm, I'm kind of late to get into the Halo community. Uh, to be honest with it, I started the content, would have been uh, mid-2018 was when I really got the, the content grind going. Wow, that's... 
That's yeah. quite the uh, quite the timeline. You know, it's it's always crazy to hear where sure. uh, where you come from and where you end up, if you will, and, and how some of those roots come full circle and, and get you kind of back into working in the industry that you loved as a kid, um, or the exact game in this sense. But uh, that's pretty crazy. So yeah. then. Halo 5 obviously being that first and big title that you really dove into. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about like just your overall experience with Halo 5 from starting as a content creator to maybe community events, getting into casting HCS, etc.? Sure. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I've, I've been a big fan of Halo 5 since day one. I, I think at the time I was kind of, I was waiting for the next Gears game. Halo 5 kind of took me by surprise because I was kind of always in and out with Reach and 4. When I played Halo 5, immediately just gravitated to it, was grinding it. I was in university at the time, though, so a lot going on with school. Uh, when I finally got out of university was when I realized I wanted to dive more into the commentary, dive more into, uh, you know, just yeah, public speaking, casting opportunities around gaming. Uh, I picked up, a, just to try to fast forward the story, I picked up some experience, uh, realized, you know, I, I had a knack for breaking down video games and... Uh, and at the time, Halo was my, my passion. I was super invested in esports. So I decided to try it with Halo. So it would have been, so I had, a, I had an old video 2017 summer that, that was uh, how to move like Shotzi. And that video caught like a little bit of fire. So I kind of came back March, February, March, 2018. And I made like a how to move like Shotzi 2. And then from there, I just started breaking down Halo videos uh, on like a weekly basis. Uh, things really picked up for me. It would have been in summer of 2018. When I was really invested in the grind, uh, T Squared saw one of my videos, which was an honor at the time, pretty crazy. He saw the video, liked it, uh, invited me on a talk show that he was hosting called HCS Weekly, uh, and that was run by UGC. And just randomly, he had a falling out with, uh, with this talk show after he interviewed me. And the interview was such a great time that UGC decided to ask me to come on and host the show. So next thing I knew, I was doing my YouTube videos and I was hosting the, the weekly you know, HCS weekly talk show. And that was beautiful because every week I was talking to a different Halo personality in the community. Like I kind of worked my way up, you know, you'd have different, uh, you know, different pros uh, on, I don't know, I don't want to rank the pros, but, but eventually I had, you know, Roy, Lunchbox, Snipe Down, Pistola, like all these big names were jumping onto the show and then 343 employees. Uh, so it was an amazing experience because I got to meet the community, become invested. And that led to casting opportunities with UGC and then eventually DreamHack, and then eventually HCS. So it all kind of snowballed from the YouTube and from the uh, the talk show. Incredible. Yeah, I want to go back to, you, you talked about that knack uh, for breaking down Halo content. And I've been watching yeah. a lot of your, your YouTube content recently. Uh, obviously, I watched your brand new video, Breaking Down uh, Streets, that new map we got to see right before, obviously, they dropped the, the Halo Infinite multiplayer. Where does that knack come from? Is this just like... Uh, an analytical drive you've kind of had always you like to break things down to their minutiae because I feel like one of your best strengths and I think it comes through in your casting as well but very very succinctly in your YouTube is your ability to break things down so well and, and you you also make things very easily digestible for a new player mm -hmm. as well as I feel like a pro player or very high-end talent can come in and still learn something as well from yeah. your content. Uh, I, I, th I think there's like a number of angles to that. First off, I, I've always loved performance. I, I was uh, I played a lot of music growing up. I started with the saxophone, grade six, and I, I've always had that. I like the spotlight, you know. I like to perform, and I think eventually that went from music to public speaking. Uh, always had the passion for gaming. At one point, I was on this this show with Cineplex, this movie company. We had this esports show, and I had a personal segment called Game Changer, and I had to break down a play, and I decided to go with Smash Bros. because I was a big Smash Bros fan at the time. I had a, a, a Surface Pro in my hand and a big TV beside me, and I just kind of went all in one shot. I was like, you know, this is why Armada did this, and and uh, it was uh, it was a Ganondorf versus Peach. Anyway, it was the breakdown <laughs> went well. Everybody was like, holy crap, that was really cool. You yeah. should do more. So I just started doing more, getting the reps in. I, I think the reason why it's it's so detailed, and and it's also very carefully done though. It's uh, I'm a I'm a hypercritical person. <laughs> I think is the biggest thing. Uh, if I'm being 100% honest, I, I want I want to bring value to people, and I want it I want the content to be more than just informative. I want yeah, it's cheesy, but I want to entertain, I want to inform, and I want to inspire people. So there's like there's kind of layers to it where it's not good enough for me to just give you the information. I need to deliver it in a way that is easily digestible, but also like it, there's an energy behind it. You know, it's it's also why it, there's different versions of me. Like you you see me on YouTube. 
and I'm like super animated. I'm I'm out there. I'm Shyway's like a, I'm a fan of Shyway. He's like a different guy, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and that's because that's who I think I need to be to to not only teach something but to inspire that initiative to get you to to want to play the game to grind the game. So it's it's like I'm you know I'm hypercritical. I want it to be good. I want it to be liked. Uh, so that's probably where it comes from. Uh, but it's also tough on me too. You know, it's it's that the more that the, these videos get viewed the more pressure i put on myself to do things better every time to be to be funny to be engaging every time so it's a it's a tough process man i i go through a lot of retakes a lot of retakes till i i feel like it's it's out succinctly and it's you know it's done right so it's not glamorous but uh but the end end result you know thankfully you guys like the content yeah, I, I think that that definitely comes through in the content itself, right? You can really see the the comments and the viewers and the people on Twitter and things like that, just how much love and appreciation they have for the style of content you produce because you can see the amount of effort and work that goes into, um, again, cultivating type of content that can educate and expire and, you know, inspire, <laughs> not expire. Um, so I guess... <laughs> hopefully I guess, not expire, too. No, hopefully not expire, <laughs> right? Long-lasting. Yeah, of course. It's got to be. <laughs> um, so I guess jumping into Halo Infinite and, mm -hmm. you know, your involvement when it comes to, you know, being a forerunner, being able to be involved in various, you know, for lack of better terms, testing and other elements of the game itself for these past two years. Uh, how was that experience, I guess, at a high level? Just overall, just kind of, you know, we obviously saw the uh, the credits of all the other individuals that you were working with yeah. uh, as well. So just kind of, I guess, walk us through at a high level what you can as far as what how that experience was, what you kind of got to do on a day-to-day, week-to-week, whatever it might be type basis. Sure. Uh, I mean, first off, Super cool opportunity. So surprised that it hit me. Honestly, I was like, I was floored. I didn't realize I was going to get a chance to play the game before it came out. Uh, it would have been end of the year 2019, right after I hosted DreamHack Atlanta. I came home, and then Unishek uh, and and Jess Birdie, I, I believe, or she, maybe that's, I, anyway, Unishek, uh, they came to me on in an email, and we had an interview about this whole Forerunner program. Uh, and then it kind of started there. It would have been December 2019, but we didn't actually kick things off till around March 2020 when I got invited to Seattle, which was really awesome. They uh, they sent all the Forerunners to Seattle to go play the game, to play campaign. The heartbreaking part of this story, though, was uh, it was March 2020, right at the start of COVID when things started to get really bad. So we touched down in Seattle. The moment we touched down, there's a Microsoft-wide email that goes out that says Microsoft is shutting down its offices and forcing everybody to work from home. So uh, basically the whole trip wrapped up the moment we got there. Like we got there, like so they canceled everything, said, sorry, I was super dejected by it. Uh, you know, it sucked. Uh, some of the other forerunners, they stuck around. They, they decided to, you know, explore the city, have a trip. But I basically went there, stayed the night, went home the very next morning. So it was oh, a bit no. of a shame, but uh, yeah. But I mean, still a great opportunity that, that it got started there. And then it, what it would have been was in the months following uh, they would send builds of the game and every, it was infrequent at first. So it would have been once every, like, I want to say two months or so, we would get a build of the game for a weekend, very similar to the public flights, same type of thing. You play it, uh, experience it all, except it was a lot more personal in that uh, there would be surveys we'd fill out afterwards. And then after the surveys, there would be outcome calls with the team. We would all get together in a discord call and we would talk about the outcomes of our surveys and what the three, what the three, four, three, uh, you know, members were doing to answer some of the concerns we might have had. Uh, we don't have a huge impact on what, you know, kind of changes in the game overall, but if we all kind of unanimously agreed on something, then usually there was an issue that needed to be addressed in a big way. So it, it really came down to, does the whole Forerunner team agree that this is a problem? And then they would address it, if so. That's awesome, honestly. <laughs> and I mean, coming from, you, you talk about your roots in Halo 2, and then how much you loved Halo 5, and the uh, ability and the opportunity to be so heavily involved in getting to have a say and help put together uh, I Infinite is is obviously an incredible opportunity. Now, uh, you know, it, it was one thing I was thinking about yesterday with the release of Infinite and thinking about, you know, obviously mutual friend of ours and, and co-worker Clutch, who, who works on the, the Sunday shows with us, and obviously he's working with HCS and everybody at the Halo team. Uh, there's got to be quite a sense of pride for you then uh, not only your ability to, to work on the game, but now with it out, you know, the release the multiplayer, we're getting the release of the campaign coming in uh, uh, just under a month. You've got to be feeling an incredible amount of pride with this coming out and having being able to say, you know, hey, I was a part of that. 
Definitely. If I mean, it feels amazing to be in the credits. Uh, you know, it's it's a goal that I I I didn't have originally. Like a you know that just suddenly kind of came to be that I'm you know honored to be a part of. I think obviously it's a much it's a much bigger moment. I want to say for a guy like Clutch, who's you know sure. he's been working hard. He's been in the pro team, much more invested with it. For me, it was you know we we're there for the weekend, and then we're kind of you know what I mean. Like it's a, it's a little little role throughout, but something I was really really happy to be a part of. Uh, and, and really, it was just the opportunity to, to opportunity to learn so much uh, about Halo Infinite and the process that it went through. Because we played very old, you know, versions of this game that were not arted up, that were just you know little like you know poorly, uh, it just polygons. A lot of lot of uh, you know, I don't know what the, the terminology is for it, but you know, it went from no art to 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 being graphically beautiful, to being and and having very you know choppy frames to all of a sudden smooth performance. So to see like the transition and the mechanics and, and and to see that game slowly kind of become its own thing, I think was pretty beautiful. And it the biggest, uh, I guess, most thankful kind of takeaway I have is how it's allowed me to not only learn more about Halo 5 and my experience grinding that game, but, but really just guide my content, right? Like stuff, and you could say it's cheat codes in a way, uh, but I kind of worked to get to this point too, but uh, it, it guided a lot of my videos in a sense that like something would come out, a trailer would come out, and the trailer would tease a bunch of things. And obviously I would know the answers to all the questions, but I had to find like a logical way to deduce those answers. I couldn't just come in and make a YouTube video and be like, I think this is this, I think this is this. I had to like <laughs> try to piece the puzzle together. And I think that was a really cool experience being on the inside to do that. It's, it's helped me grow as a content creator. Damn, you should, it was, it was the perfect opportunity to become Shyway the Prophet. Yeah, right. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, you, you had it. It was right in the cusp of your hand just to really make people believe that you had all of the answers. No, but um, obviously it's no small feat to be involved in, in this nature. So uh, definitely a huge congratulations on that. And I'd love to pivot the conversation towards more of the competitive esports side of things for Halo Infinite. I'd love to get your base thoughts on kind of, you know, where what you're excited about, I guess, for the upcoming HCS. Like, what you, where's your head at as far as uh, the future of Halo Infinite Esports? Um, and then I'd say, well, let's talk a little bit about the teams after that. But mm -hmm. over, overall, I'd love just to get your general thoughts on what HCS has announced even today. I know their pipeline is now officially yeah. uh, out on the uh, out on the docket. Is Super it? excited for Anaheim. Yes. Oh. They announced the at least the calendar for the next yeah, year. The base calendar mm -hmm. for the year. I'm about to hop off this interview right now and read it. <laughs> been, I know, uh, I've right? Been waiting to see it because I, yeah, I, I don't actually know the roadmap myself. I mean, I, I obviously I've got some you know some intel, but I would love to see what that roadmap looks like for beyond December, right? And that's the beautiful thing is uh, Halo Five struggled so much with that kind of planning process. So so it's great to see how three four three has kind of learned lessons in that category, so that we can start. Uh, with a plan we can start and that's just to answer your question what i'm so kind of excited about is uh this game more than halo 5 from the gate it, it feels like a collaborative effort between pro team members and 343 right you've got a lot of really sweaty competitive settings and a lot of uh features that i think the hardcore uh community from back in you know the classic games would have loved to see in today's halo like the br starts the no radar uh, just a lot of those those elements, and you also have the cracked advanced movement stuff as well. Uh, that's where Halo Five, I think, struggled so much. Is you had you had autos, you had social radar, you had ground pound, you had Spartan charge from day one for two years. But now our, our starting point is pretty badass. Like we're starting at a great spot here. So obviously, I, I'm sure there'll be balance concerns, but just the the idea that we can start at a point that people are happy with, and then kind of refine it as we go. Like I just think the potential is is crazy. Uh, and then you got the partnered teams too, and I mean, you know, seeing seeing Optic recently join the fold, seeing Faze, seeing all the, and I'm sure we'll talk about it. It's just you know that brings a ton of excitement, ton of life to Halo that hasn't been there for a while. Yeah, no, the partnered teams. I mean, the roadmap in general, obviously, I totally agree. Starting off a brand new game with a roadmap of actual yeah. like all the way to a world championship which is taking place in october um and they have you know majors and splits and seasonal championships throughout the whole year you can't ask for that much more in the esports space you really can't right and and especially with the fact that we know that three for three and the and the um the halo esports team is going to be focusing on the grassroots programs and allowing third-party tournament organizers like esports arena to come in and produce our own content on top of all of the official pro components that are going on so you really can't ask for much more 
the execution, you know, I, I can't see the future, of course, but regardless, uh, I, I am really excited for the future of Halo Infinite because of the fact that that roadmap really is laid out. I mean, just think about things like Fortnite. You know what I mean? I love using that as an example because of how horrendous it was. But um, a, a game with that much popularity, right, like that much hype going into it, imagine if they would have actually had, you know, a, a full world championship lined up in that first year when all the crazy ninja and myth stuff was going on and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like, it didn't start until the whole next year. You know what I mean? Like they missed their entire hype wave, and then they were like, "All right, here you go. Time to here's your esports well, circuit." And everyone was like, "Nah." The beauty of Fortnite, though, is it was such a surprise. I'm sure for the developers as well, right? Like, remember Fortnite in 2016? Do you guys do you remember what that game was? Oh, years no, before, save the world. Oh yeah, wasn't it just it was, uh, yeah, like yeah, a it was PVE the, it was entirely? Tower defense. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it's a PvE tower defense zombie mode or something in 2016 and kind of a failed game. I think not many people played it for two years and then they put out a battle royale and then all of a sudden the thing just pops off. So I can understand why, you know, they probably weren't ready to scale on the esports side, but man, you know, crazy. Uh, but like you said, that's why it's great that Halo Infinite is starting out uh, with that kind of precedent. Uh, and it's already receiving praise as well on Twitter, which is great. Like I, I saw the, the tweet from uh, Courage JD saying, you know, not like Call of Duty, Battlefield, take notes. Not many games do this. Have the esports skins day one, right? Like have all that kind of infrastructure set and ready to go to ensure that we get a banger tournament. You know, this December, hopefully. Yep, I mean, ex exactly that. And then obviously, like you mentioned, with the partner teams, what a cool integration to kick off, right? Like you go in there, you're playing, you realize that you're a gray skin noob, and you're like, all right, I got to get this gray skin off before people start ch chasing me around the map for free KP. <laughs> um, and it's just like, I got right. it off going, I go straight to the store, and it's like, boom, oh, HCS skin, it's free, like right off the bat, I can just get that one if I want to, and then I can pick a team one if I want to like purchase one. Like, what a cool overall experience, and I'm sure that there'll be tie-ins with Twitch where you can get... Um, um, you know, free points to purchase those skins by just watching the HCS Ooh. on the weekend, stuff like, oh, if that doesn't exist That's a good yet, idea. you're Take welcome. Take notes, uh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, I was like, Everybody, you're welcome for that. But stuff like that, you know, it's, it's. Um, yeah. I know that, oh, oh, I think the Blizzard and the Overwatch League did that. No one cared. That's why no one knows. But um, yep. uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but um, stuff like that, I, I think it's, I think it's obviously absolutely incredible. I love seeing that, you know, the different partner teams are already so involved. And uh, I think it's going to cause a chain reaction of, uh, a lot, a ton, probably most, if not all, esports orgs in North America and outside all coming in to pick up a Halo team. You know, we saw this in uh, Apex Legends. I, I love to use an example because we're so involved in Apex Legends, where when we joined the right. Apex Legends community, there was six total North American professional rosters, only six. When we wow. joined and we started, you know, we started paying competitive teams like the TSMs, the Cloud Nines to participate in our league, and then EA alongside, not that it had correlation, but EA also launched their pro league, started paying the pro league teams, giving them support, right? So when you have the the organizer, the third party developers, the foundation, the whole entire ecosystem funding the pro teams that allow pro teams to exist in that ecosystem, because it turns out it's not free to exist in a, each individual gaming ecosystem. Sure. It, it, it just creates so much hype around. I mean, just look at Apex Legends now. There's like 20 yeah. to 30 professional signed, like pro North American rosters of like real organizations in comparison yeah. to six like a year ago. And that's crazy to see. And that same thing can happen yeah. so fast in Halo when you start off and you already have, is it eight already or 12? Nine. nine? nine. You already nine. have nine partner teams mm -hmm. already like right off the gate. And then you're going to have the, for lack of better terms, the TSMs, the CLGs, the Cloud Nines who see that, even though some of those are already in there, they see that and they're like, oh, like we got to get on this train as soon as possible. Um, so that's really exciting for me to see, again, the entire foundation is feels like it's so laid out. And now it's just a matter of, will the community pick it up and support it? You know, and can they keep uh, keep the game up and things like that? But overall, I, again, I'm, I'm I'm very excited for the future of competitive Halo Infinite. Hell yeah, yeah. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, when you look at all of that too, shall we? Uh, it, it's really interesting, and uh, obviously, you know, when you eventually do check out that roadmap, you'll see that that uh, I think that Seattle trip is uh, going to happen in the future. The World Championship is in Seattle. Let's go next october so maybe you can uh you can cash that one in just call Hopefully. 343 and be like hey you know didn't get to have it the first time maybe we could do it this time around but uh when you look at the orgs that are involved right you see fanatic cloud nine phase clan you already talked about optic and all these other big orgs involved and now you look at this wealth of talent 
that is either signed already or looking to put together rosters to get signed to compete, what excites you the most about what is going to happen here now over the next month or two? Obviously, we have Raleigh coming up next month. It's going to be quite a you know, rush to sign some of these big talents in the Halo space. What kind of makes you most yeah. excited about that? So many different things, man. Uh, I mean, first off, this Raleigh event sounds kind of crazy because I, I think we've got a lot of pros from different games jumping in. I don't know how long they'll stick around, but I think a lot of people just want to kind of be a part of this first event and, and see how it goes. So I think we got some COD pros maybe. Like, I, I, I don't know if this is factual, but I think like, you know, Karma... Uh, in, in some, he's got like a team, maybe. I, I don't know. I've, I've been hearing hearing things that you've got, you know, high tier COD players, you've got Gears players, you've got all these guys who just want to be a part of this this Raleigh event. So that's going to be exciting. Uh, and and me, as far as like what I like to watch in uh, in Halo is, I've I've always kind of gravitated to Shotzi, to Frosty, to Bound, to some of those like phenoms, the especially the the movement, the tech skill kind of fiends who are super quick, super cracked. Uh, I'm waiting to see who the next Shotzi is, right? Like, I know we got Frosty, we got Bound, we got a lot of, uh, you know, star. Uh, and, I mean, somebody like Frosty isn't even an up-and-comer anymore. He's a, you know, he's a he's a veteran in the scene. Bound, I think, is an interesting one because he's respected as a top player. But we haven't seen him at, at all, like, even physically. Nobody knows what he looks like. Uh, but then I want to see who's that new kid, right? Like, who's that, that, that unknown variable who's going to come out of nowhere and shine? And hopefully we get to see it. Uh, the beautiful thing about Halo is you can kind of spot those individuals a little more so, I think, than some other games because there's a lot more room for that display of individual skill because of the, the combat dance, you know, kind of in Halo. So excited to see who kind of who kind of blows up and really takes the show. Uh, and, and just to see high-level Halo competition on a land stage, man. I, I mean, it, watching streams yesterday was such a treat because you've already got Sentinels, you've already got Optic. They're all grinding. They're in matchmaking in full four squads, just sweating it out with callouts and everything. So... It's been so long since I've been part of that launch experience. It takes me back to the early Halo 5 days when everything was crazy too, uh, except this might even be better. So, you know, I'm happy to be a part of it. Okay, okay. I got a, I got a, couple, I got a couple quick fire questions to, <laughs> I think, as we get towards the end okay. here of the interview. Mm -hmm. uh, of the nine partnered squads and their uh, rosters that are currently public, where's your head at as far as... You got any, maybe a top two, a top three that you're really keeping your eyes on as far as performance for Raleigh? I mean, no idea, honestly. Uh, you, you can't doubt Sentinels just because they've, they've shown dominance throughout the entirety of Halo 5 and they've kind of maintained a lot of that dominance, I want to say, in the, the off season. Uh, can't doubt it was Envy, now Optic, right? They're, they're definitely, I think, in a top three. And then I want to see what happens to Boo Boo Doo Boo Bound and, uh, and, and Falcated. I heard that Snipedown was supposed to team with them, but because the game came out early, apparently Snipedown might not be able to play with them anymore because he, he's so busy with Apex, he won't have full time to commit to that infinite grind. So I think that Bound, Boo Boo, and, uh, and Falcated are looking for a fourth. So a bit unfortunate there, but I think that team, they haven't announced it. If I had to make a guess, I think that's the phase roster, and maybe they're just, there is a question mark for that fourth player. So. I think that could be a top three team too, especially depending on who they pick up. But uh, there's a lot of potential. There's a lot of really good teams. Any of those nine teams could pop off, I think, at any second. I love that. I think that, uh, yeah, Snipe Down, I mean, with the ALGS Pro League, mm -hmm. that really is every single weekend. He's busy. It's, it's very, it's, it definitely would be hard to uh, operate in both as I think they're pretty full-time schedules, but uh, that'd be a pretty interesting FaZe Clan roster to see. Okay, but I agree with those. Those are some good, those are some good uh, suggestions, or uh, those are some good uh, predictions, if you will. Um, so take a step back, and I think I know your answers, but I feel like we have to ask just because of everything we've been talking about. So um, which Halo game would you say has the best music? Oh. oh. Best music. <laughs> best music. Ooh. Uh it has to be two or three for me because okay. so one had amazing music but two was when it really started to hit its stride and you got the the steve why am i is it steve vi steve who's the the electric guitar came in in halo 2 that shit yes. was iconic <laughs> uh and then halo 3 halo 3 is when you got the real epic kind of soundtracks with the drums and the, the you know they really leaned into the da -da -da -da, da -da 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 -da, you know so <laughs> halo 2 or 3 it would have been those two games <laughs> all right how about campaign which Halo game do you feel like has the best campaign? Ooh. Uh, also has to be Halo 2 or 3. 
right? Because I think Halo 2 it really started to hit its stride. Halo 3, you got the, some of the coolest open sandboxes with all the vehicles and the weapons. I liked the pacing of 2, though, and how they, they found a really cool way to introduce a new exciting thing to you kind of as you went. Uh, so once again, I don't know, between 2 and 3 for the campaigns. All right. Well, now it's time for the Toss real it. question. Multiplayer. Which... Halo game has the best. He's putting you on the spot today, shall we? I mean, we gotta That's know fine. the people. The uh, people need the answers <laughs> from the prophet himself. Yes. Years, year, <laughs> the prophet himself. <laughs> uh, years ago, I would have said Halo Two. I was a big Halo Two fan as a kid. I love the mechanics in Halo Two, but it has to be Halo Five today. I, I think Halo today, Halo Five is kind of untouchable. It's it's a special game to me. If it wasn't for Halo Five, I wouldn't even be in this community. I wouldn't be as as invested as I am. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a movement guy before I'm a, I'm a, anyway, the movement, the mechanics in that game are incredible. I hope that Infinite can one day hit that kind of layer of depth. It's not quite there yet. I think it's got a lot of potential though. I love it. I love it. All right, Shai, my last piece, tell us, tell the people where they can find you, where to, what to be on the lookout for, what desks you're going to be popping up on in the next couple of months. Give us the, uh, give us the Shyway 101. Sure. Uh, YouTube.com slash uh, Shyway. Jesus, like I don't even know my, my own tags. Uh, Twitter.com slash the Shyway. Twitch.tv slash the Shyway. I can't say where I'm going to be, but I will be on some desks, I, I believe. We'll, we'll say that. Uh, I'm doing everything I can to. That's a dream for me is, is to be on as many of those desks, on those many of, uh, as many of those casting opportunities as I could be a part of. So so I'm a, you know, I'm gonna be grinding. I'm gonna do what I can to be there in, in Seattle, to be there at the the big, you know, world championship. I uh, just can't say anything about what I'm doing just yet, but uh, it's under, I trust it's understandable. I'm for. It's understandable, and and when you look <laughs> at that pipeline, I think it's February. There's an Anaheim. Uh, there's a big Anaheim major. So when you come out for that, let's go. We'll we'll, uh, we'll get a chance to finally sync up in person. You can come down to the yep. esports arena headquarters. That's about 15 minutes away from the venue, uh, and it'll be a good time. But uh, I think that's uh, I think that's it for us on this portion of the uh, of the podcast for the day. Of course, we'll have some uh, big news or the rest of the esports news and things like that coming in right after this, guys. But Shawe, we really obviously want to appreciate and thank you for coming on, giving us some of your time today and chatting with us as the forerunner, hashtag profit yes. of Halo Infinite. <laughs> uh, oh, it's, no. been, it's been a blast chatting with you and, and getting a <laughs> chance to really kind of pick your brain on some of these, uh, these new components of the new title. So really, uh, really appreciate you coming on. Thank you for having me. Good to be here. Nice to chat with you guys again and, uh, and can't wait to chat with you more. I'm sure we got big things coming. Definitely. Cool. All right. We'll be right back with some news. Yes, we will. All right, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, awesome to sit down with Shyway there. Hope you guys all enjoyed that as much as we did. But Luke and I are back to talk about some of the news from this last week. So let's get right into it. And we're going to start at the top with a little bit of an interesting story here. Xbox and Gucci have released 100 Xbox Series X. X's, I guess, for $10,000 a piece, a Gucci Xbox Series X. Did you, uh, did you see that? You know, I, what did you think? I did, I did see it. Um, <laughs> I can't, I can't necessarily see, I, I understood it. Okay. I, I, Same. You know, again, I'm always a fan of them making something that's like way too expensive and only like a certain amount of people in the world would even A, want or B, be able to purchase this item for no yeah. reason. And, you know, I think that's a fun thing to do because, mm -hmm. you know, they're catering to a specific audience. This one, I don't know. It didn't really land on me. I was a little, I was a little. What did you think about the case? I, you see the, the big Xbox carrying case? I thought it was cute. You know, okay. I just didn't understand it still why anyone would want it. But yeah. I was like, okay, like $10,000. I mean, that's pretty standard for resale on a normal Xbox Series X nowadays anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So, I'm <laughs> just kidding. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess my, 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 I'm just kind of like, whatever. I, was, I think it was lackluster in comparison to like some of the other collabs that we've seen, mm -hmm. uh, just in general from these super bougie brands. But it's fun nonetheless. So, woo. Yeah, I mean, I guess I look at it and I'm like, yeah, that feels like this feels like something Gucci would do. Like, yeah. I wasn't necessarily surprised. Obviously, the price tag is insane. I'm very curious to see. I feel like there's going to be at least one or two people that buy it, never touch it, and they'll sell it again in like 10 years. And I'm curious to see. You know, obviously we're a long way away from finding this out, but I'd be curious to see what that like resales for. 
in the future, if like, I had to guess, like, could I you get like twenty grand? Plus very for little. That? Really? You think yeah. so? Well, only because like the technology the isn't going to age. True. And Gucci itself as a brand usually is kind of in and out of like cultural fame. So I yeah. think right now they're just kind of on a bubble where they're pretty popular. Yeah. But like in ten years, they probably won't be popular at all. You know, it's not like brands like Gucci, I feel like, don't really have as much longevity as, you know, specific brands could, if you mm -hmm. will. Because they could just become unpopular in a year. Mm -hmm. Like, I have a bunch of, like, super collectible Blizzard pins. Guess what's not worth any money? Super collectible Blizzard pins. Is that because they went out of style or because of... It can be, it can be for whatever reason you want it to be. <laughs> But I can tell you. I I think I can point to some very specific, not time-oriented reasons. But I can tell you for a fact sure. that it, I would find it very unlikely that these would have any kind of resale value, and it's okay. more of just like I'm rich. Look at my flex. Yeah, time and play for sure. It does feel very flexy. Yeah, not that cool. I think, I think the the carrying case is is kind of cool. I'm all about the screw it mentality. Yeah. Like, yeah, let's do it. Why not? Yeah. Tyler, let's get one. Yeah. For the office, so we can just he already, already pre-ordered it. Don't worry, yeah. it's, okay. on, it's on the way. It. Love to see it's it. It's on the way. Uh, that's the weirdest story we're going to talk about. Yeah, today. yeah, we had to start somewhere. Let's uh, let's talk about some Smash main okay. stage happened yeah. this weekend. We've had honestly a lot of incredible Smash events over the last few months, and main stage didn't disappoint. Nickelodeon All Star Brawl was awesome. Melee was cool, but we got to talk about Ultimate. It's a big topic uh, every couple of weeks here, uh, and Leo. Big, big win. Uh, a big finish, too. Takes down uh, Spargo in Grand Finals of Main Stage. How about the end to that last game? I mean, we already know that Leo is an incredible player. But the ability for him in such a tense situation, last stock, he's already at, I think, like 105%. And for him to play as aggressively especially off stage as he did to take that last stock and finish main stage was i was just like this guy's insane this is unreal watching him play in general is always is always surreal it feels like it's yeah. it's like it, it's so crazy his his run through winners was so so dominant he just eats everyone up just mm. nom 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 <laughs> like like literally no problem just everyone yeah. just gets absolutely swallowed whole like Elegant, who was on the other side of the winners, uh, or was in winners finals with MK Leo, mm -hmm. um, was playing out of his mind, right? Luigi player just going, going absolutely crazy, doing all this stuff, 3 0 kids, beating all these top players. Gets to MK Leo, gets his put, pushed right in. <laughs> just whoop, see ya, you know what I mean? And it's, it's so just like the difference between I'm one of the best players in the world to I'm the best player in the world is ludicrous, yeah. right? And, and he, I feel like he has such a, that gap. And Spargo, who's a very young player in comparison, which is funny because I feel like I feel like it was yesterday when I was saying MK Leo was the young player, but yeah. Spargo, who's now the new young prodigy, um, you know, he's still he's still working his way up there. I'm sure nerves are still a big piece for him. You can see it in his face and his gameplay a little bit when he when he competes. But he is so good, and and I'll say the same thing that a lot of the pro players are saying is that you know he just needs a little bit of time. Yeah, he just needs a little bit more time before he can become that best. But be getting this close, resetting cool. the bracket, getting the game ten, like. And, and and the thing is, is I feel like. Because I feel like we're, we're every couple of weeks we're talking about a new Smash Major, a new big event that's happened. I feel like Spargo's name is coming up in that every top time. three to top five mm -hmm. almost every time. So I feel like Spargo is incredibly close to taking that next step. And even with, and obviously this loss is going to sting, but when you when you look at all of it and how close Spargo is, it's like just keep at what you're doing it's go you'll they'll break through eventually like, yes yeah, so no it's, it's one of those things where like when you travel to a lot of events mm -hmm. in smash specifically because of how many there are at the, the high level your your group of roster or your group of players and your seating so your path to finals is always so different in those sense that you know it's the more you the more you go to the tournaments obviously um the better experience you get on all that kind of jazz obviously but you know we see a lot of players who don't go to a lot of events but when they're one or two events a year because they go to the ones that are in their regions and they mm -hmm. do really well at those they don't really travel outside of that what's so impressive about mk leo is he travels to every single event across the country and he craps yeah. on everybody yeah across the board mm -hmm. right and you don't see that as often with a lot of other players because 
those players will either, you know, they'll, maybe they do go to a lot of those events, but they only do good in a couple of them. Or they only go to events in their own regions and tend to do pretty good in those because they're pretty good, but they don't travel outside of those. So, yeah. you know, you don't hear their name too often, right? So the, it's, it's, it's such an interesting balance, I feel like, because it's like, oh, you can, like, win one major, and all of a sudden you're like, but Spargo hasn't won a major, right? Like, but, it, you know, this guy has won a major, so, but Spargo could probably be better than that guy. You just don't know because mm -hmm. Spargo's entering so many tournaments, and he's placing so consistently up there that he, he is definitely almost there. Yeah. But with MK Leo placing first in every tournament, yeah. the difference there is astronomical. Yeah. Because that means Spargo's losing to mostly MK Leo, mm -hmm. but also other various random people throughout the country in every event, right? So, you know, it's it's pretty crazy. I'll, I'll end my ramble just on the cinematic finish that was the tournament. So mm -hmm. I, I love it, bro. I'm sitting there watching it. MK Leo. Uh, I think it's 100% to 0%. MK Leo's down 100%, yep. right? He's his uh, Spargo's at 0%. He has a, a he on Violet has 100%. Runs off the right side of the stage at 0% and goes for a full down smash, bro. I love it. He is talking about it too. He's like, he's going to try and spike he you just like goes as soon as he spotted on that last dog. <laughs> and and he misses barely. Yeah. Like probably, you know, a couple frames whatever it is, he misses it though. And I and I'm literally like to in my head I'm all foreshadowing. <laughs> I'm like, you know, it's like literally like a movie. They get yeah. back up on stage, get to the left side, he completely reads the air dodge, gets a back air of him off stage, and since he's Aegis, he doesn't have good recovery options. So yeah. he basically only has one option option which is to side b and to watch mk leo perfectly hop and then like he's side being hops again fast falls straight down and down airs him at the same time it was the craziest shit i ever saw in my life yeah. i literally like threw up on my keyboard <laughs> i was just like i was like no, no like i was like it's crazy like it was just it was so incredible and the pop off from mk leo so clutch like you said we yeah. played that high level under all kinds of pressure just just crazy, and I don't know if uh, you know. I think Spargo come like uh, he like panic air dodged and he like totally annihilated them, and it was just yeah. so brutal to watch. But super fun. MKLeo is the hero of all men, and yeah. I'm excited to see him continue to dominate until Spargo can grab the uh, what is it, Chalice? Yeah, yeah. Uh, last point on that, I will say. Uh, also love the respect from Leo. Wins the set, pops off, then turns around, gave Spargo a hug. You know said whatever he said um, uh, uh, to Spargo there, which is cool. And si then also... Puede. He just whispered, si se puede. <laughs> si se puede. Si se puede. But, uh, and then did you, uh, did you see the interview um, after the set With where e. Leo talked about how he considered switching to, to Aegis, Aegis for the dinner. and then said, Spargo is just, just a better Aegis player. Like, I can't do it. I have to stick to Byla to win. And I love that respect. Like, obviously going like, hey... Spargo's by uh, Spargo's Aegis is disgusting. Like I can't just ditto this. I'll lose. So love that. So I think uh, Leo sees what we see, hundred uh, percent for sure, which is awesome. So love to see it there. Congrats to Leo. Spargo, keep it up. We you know we got high hopes uh, for you. Uh, let's talk FGC. Rebel Kumite mm. happened in Vegas over the weekend. Some of the best Street Fighter Five, Guilty Gear Strive, and Tekken Seven players in the world all headed out to Vegas to compete. Uh, we actually at Esports Arena actually sent a few players out there uh, as well to compete in the LCQ. Uh, this is a really sick event. Did you see the set for it? Like they had the, the octagon, the trophies uh, that, that all the players won were incredible. Really, really cool event. I think uh, FGC, I really love. They seem to do a really good job of leaning into uh, a very unique style for a lot of the events that they do and i think they embrace the fighting in the fighting game championship for a lot of that stuff and i thought it was really cool i thought the event was sick a uh, lot of incredible games uh, obviously some big champions across the three titles but uh rebel community was tight yeah you know red bull definitely does it right when it comes to the fighting game community they, yeah. they definitely know how to produce some super cool events and you gotta love them um and obviously, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of 1v1 games in general. Sure. I think that, you know, all the, the best of the best esports titles have all always been 1v1s because uh, it's just so, it's, it's such, just such a different style and you can do a lot more um, production wise and content wise, stuff like that with an individual yep. rather than a, a team that's ran by an individual, you know what I mean? 
Um, but yeah, overall, I thought I thought it was a super cool event. Uh, I'm glad that, that all the players we sent out there had a really good time. Uh, they were not able to make it through the LCQ, but only one really does. So what do you yeah. you know what can you expect? But they did do pretty good. You know, they 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 got a couple wins underneath their belts, and, and they had a blast. And that's really what it's all about. So um, super cool event. I hope I can make it out to the next one. I would have watched more of the event itself if this weekend. Like, I didn't have already, like, four different tournaments on my screen. I literally, yeah. like, I'm like, I can't even watch it. Like, mm -hmm. I have to watch VODs of it this week, maybe, because I, I was watching I was watching our, our boys compete in the 10K, our boys yep. compete in another in, 10K. In two 10Ks, which uh, we'll talk about a little I bit. I was watching main stage, obviously, throughout yep. the whole weekend, as well as I was consuming my monitors. I, I beat Metroid Dread. We'll talk about that later. Yes. I, I was... Uh, Obviously playing some games and stuff like that, but um, but overall, I, I you know you gotta you gotta love Kumite. I'm, I'm super excited that we got a chance to to team up with those guys and send some mm -hmm. of our boys out there to, to have a good time. And um, I don't know what's next as far as the timeline goes, but I know that these sub events are just gearing up, and I'm excited yeah. just for fighting game tournaments to be happening all the time. So yeah, the return of the FGC, one of the I mean one of the scenes that got hit the most by COVID. Because it's so heavily laid Gotta be the most. All about those community yeah. tournaments, everybody coming out got to your thrashed, weeklies and stuff. Bro. Yeah, absolutely got, got thrashed. Bodied. So, uh, love to see the FGC coming back. And I know certainly they are happy to see these events coming out. Just a quick congratulations, obviously, to the win winners, Problem X and Street Fighter V. Uh, Go Bow in Guilty Gear. Apologies if I'm pronouncing that wrong. And uh, Jen in Tekken 7. So, awesome. Uh, you know, again, hats off to Red Bull. They throw awesome awesome events and Kumite was uh, no exception there uh let's talk about those 10k though mm. 10ks though let's go to sunday uh of course we were running halo the last halo 5 event possibly we'll see uh here at esports arena on sunday and meanwhile team esports arena was throwing down in apex legends starting with the umg arena invitational which they won they beat torrent uh, in the grand finals there, 3-0, and then immediately jumped into day two of the Steel Series 10K, which was Saturday and Sunday, played six games there, finished fourth place uh, in, in that one. What a weekend, and what specifically a Sunday for Team Esports Arena. Yeah, I mean, it was crazy. It was, it's, it was nice seeing us just annihilate through that arenas tournament. Yeah. I, like, literally didn't believe it was $10,000. It was so free. It was the freest $10,000 tournament of our whole lives, bro. We walked right through that bracket. Yeah. Like, absolutely annihilated everybody. Easy money. Mm -hmm. I'm also, I was just super surprised people were running a $10,000 arenas tournament. That yeah. I never even knew what was going on. But, hey, we take those. Yeah. Good job, boys. You're all yeah. insane. Cracked out of your minds. <laughs> and then, obviously, the um, the Steel Series event was pretty interesting. It was two-day event, six yep. games each day, so 12 games total. Yep. I think we went into day two in like second or first place, like pretty yeah. pretty near the top of the board. Won the first um, game. Won the first Sunday. game, right? We won game seven. Uh, yeah, we yes. won game seven, which was sick. And after that, like the next five games, we did okay in the first couple. And our last two games were <clears throat> pretty bad. Yeah. Like we threw pretty hard or, or got griefed. It's, it's hard to tell when you're watching the uh, live broadcast yeah. if, if your teams get griefed or not. It's way easier to tell when you watch their comms because yeah. you're like, they're grieving us! They're grieving us! As you can see them, like, it landed on deliberately. Yeah. You know, because people know where they are, right? It's not like it's hard. It's a digital tournament. Everyone's cheating. Um, but, uh, so, I, I was I was pretty disappointed in that. I was really hoping the boys could have... Because we were close. Like, we almost had it. It's yeah. just like we, we, we lost out to early in the last two games. But they still managed to slide and get fourth place. Yeah, they technically tied for third, but lost the tiebreaker. Lost tie the tiebreaker, got G2. fourth. Still made a thousand bucks, though. Yep. Yeah. And I think it was, place. I believe it was five grand that they won for uh, the was, UMG I think tournament. It was four. I think it was four. I think it was five. Okay, it was I five, it. three, one, one. So weird for top four because people, they don't people, play a third, fourth People have match. the weirdest payouts. Yeah. Uh, even the top, paying out top five is weird in a battle royale. Yeah. That's 15 people you're paying out. Yeah. That's a lot of people. So... But that's still, I mean, that's a but yeah, that's a six thousand dollar Sunday, two thousand dollar per player weekend. Let's bro. go. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. That's that's Team Esports Arena for you. Um, easily one of the top teams in North America. So um, I, I I do want to talk about that. I I actually legitimately think that Team Esports Arena is actually just the best team in North America right now. Like I think you can make arguments for a couple of other teams coming up to compete with them. But I don't think anybody actually has as strong of an argument as Team Esports Arena does. They absolutely were incredible the first half of the Pro League split, 
right? Not finishing below third place. They're winning all these third party tournaments. They take the arenas one and granted you can be, you could take that win with a grain of salt, I guess, cause it's not battle Royale, but they continue to have top placings uh, in the battle Royale events. They can compete and frag with the best of the best coming up. So I, I don't know how you make a legitimate argument for anybody, but this team now we'll have to see can oh, they I'll keep this I'll rolling you, into pro league? I'll give the you the. Half, but. I'll give you the other side of the argument because okay. I would say we're probably tied for fourth, maybe fifth best team in North America right okay. now. And the reason is one, um, there's, you know, we we're talking about our team pretty young. They're pretty new. Yes. You know what I mean? Sure. So there's a pretty long history here, and when you're talking about a game that has as much RNG in it as mm -hmm. battle royales, you know, you have to take a large sample size. Otherwise, it's I don't want to say it's unfair. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? But at, at the end of the day, like you have to take a large sample size. Otherwise, you know, the facts and the statistics you're looking at aren't, you know, they're not very valid, right? Yeah. And in this case, you know, when you take teams that have that longevity to them, I'm gonna take NRG, TSM, and Complexity, which okay. are the three teams that I think are easily a better than us. Okay. Um, they're, they're both their competitive experience when it comes to the amount of tournaments they've competed in, the length of time they competed in, and the amount of LAN events they've competed in, is mm -hmm. easily trumps ours. All three sure. of those, it's not even close. Um, and the fact that all three of those teams eat third-party tournaments alive. Yeah. Like if they're in it, they win. Like, all of the third-party tournaments we, we've entered recently and we didn't win, one of those teams won. Sure. If, we, if we won, they probably weren't in the tournament. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's one of those things where when you get to that level, like, they stop competing and everything because they don't, they're streaming, they're doing their own thing, yeah. they're doing this and that, right? And for us, our boys, they're young, they're fresh competitors, and they're just eating everyone up. Yeah. Right? So I'm not saying they're not a top North American team. They are sure. a top North American team. But it's hard to give them first place um, across the board when you're sitting there looking at teams like Complexity whose background and and stats in the Pro League and before the Pro League are just like, they're crazy. Yeah. They win. They are winners. Mm -hmm. Same thing with NRG. It's sweet and team. Like, they are so high above like when it comes to consistency and their length of gameplay. And same yeah. thing with TSM. Like, TSM wins everything. Like, TSM literally has won, like, Every Twitch Rivals ever made. I know Twitch Rivals are, you know, lack of meme, whatever you want to call them, but still it's the third-party events. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. Like, we're winning the same Steel Series as just a Twitch Rivals event. Yeah. You know, so I would say that, and then uh, those are the three, and then I would say we're probably tied with Liquid. I think Liquid has kind of been in and out of, like, consistency, but when Liquid is on, they're, like, top two in North America. Like, they're, okay. they're crazy. Like, they're... Like their um, their shots, their their overall like rotations, their game their game style. I think that Team Liquid has what it takes to easily be top five or top two in the case when they're playing their best. Um, but I think you could you could probably argue that, that our team would you know or TV Sports Arena with Bear Holes and Skittles and Dupe would be um, would be kind of a fair competition okay. for fourth slash fifth in North America. There's, I hear you there, there. That's the other side of the argument. Um, I will say I think that Lan is going to be a watershed moment for this roster because obviously they've been playing and succeeding in an entirely online era, mm -hmm. which is not to be discounted entirely, but LAN is going to be a different story. Mm -hmm. And I think there's no reason that they shouldn't make it to LAN. I think they're not going to have any issue doing so. The question will be, can they be the same team they've been online at LAN? And that is, you know, nobody has that answer until we get there. And... One event, you know, if they have one bad land event at their first event, I'm not going to like throw, you know, the, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater there, but it's going to be very much on them to be able to come together under that different environment, under a, an intense amount of pressure and be able to perform there. So I think there is certainly still some growing there. I hear what you're saying. I still think they're the, they're the best team hey, right I'm all about now. It. I'm all about right it, now. Let's, but let's uh, live it up. I, I think it's a, at, at the very least, I think the fact that, there are people in the community and very specifically other pro players looking at them and as possibly, yeah. at, you know, at the very least in that like top two or three, I think is just, you know, it, they see what we have seen. So it's, it's awesome. And I'm excited to continue to follow their, their ride and their journey. It's been incredible and it is still very early in that journey, which Agreed. is very exciting. So definitely looking forward to that awesome news out of Apex for those boys. But now let's finish off with a bunch of league stuff. We're gonna start with free agency. Uh, free agency frenzy, as I call it, uh, started yesterday afternoon. The free agency period opened uh, for teams all across the world. And we're gonna talk mainly about North America here today. We'll touch a little bit on EU, but the main focus is gonna be on the LCS is there is there specifically a team you want to talk about first 
Luke, is there one that jumps out to you? Do you want to? I'll let you take the reins on this. Yeah. Well, okay. So let's start with uh, let's start with our worlds teams then. Okay. We'll start with Hundred Thieves. We talked about uh, at the end of Worlds our thoughts on you know feeling like we'd love to see all three rosters run it back. Essentially, we felt like these were good rosters that they could continue to build on what they had done at Worlds. And Hundred Thieves, at the very least thinks the same thing. Yep. They are bringing back the entirely same roster. The only adjustments is they are adding Tenacity, which is their academy top laner to create a six-man roster, which I think is awesome. Tenacity is incredible and has been, I think, the best top laner uh, outside of the LCS in North America. They also added Mithy, uh, got Mithy from Cloud9 as an assistant coach. So they now have Reaper as the head coach, Mithy as an assistant coach. I think that's an incredible addition. But Hunter Thieves, largely agree with us they're going to run it back that's good i mean again we i think they were the, the the best performing north american team at worlds yep so it's nice having that roster get a, a chance to continue growing together with that world's experience underneath their belt um and to to get back at it for another split and see what they can do yeah it's gonna be interesting to see how things work out there i love it uh, i think this roster is incredible we'll just have to see how they stack up against some of the big changes in other rosters let's talk c9 this was another one that we felt Pretty strongly, like it just kind of made sense. Well, too bad. See you, Perks. To run it back, yeah. <laughs> so, Perks is gone. We'll yeah. talk a little bit about where Perks is going later uh, as we touch on the LEC, but Perks is gone. And C9 has made a few interesting decisions. Uh, we will be talking, uh, I'll, I'll preface it right now. We're going to talk about a bunch of different rosters here in this section. Not all of them are entirely confirmed. A lot of these are based off of uh, reports specifically from uh, and, you know credit where credit is due. Dot Esports is reporting. Upcomer uh, Travis Gafford as well. They've done a lot of incredible reporting around all the free agency stuff over the last couple of weeks. So do want to give them credit. But a lot of these are not necessarily contracts have been signed, players have been announced yet. But these are pretty closely and believed to be the rosters that are going to happen. So what C9 has reportedly done is with Perks leaving. They have moved Fudge from top lane to mid lane, and they're reportedly trying to sign Summit, the top laner from Sandbox uh, in Korea, who Summit, uh, I've heard a lot of really good things. Sandbox was fairly close to making it to Worlds. So they're gonna move Fudge to mid, Summit signed in top. They're letting Vulcan go from support, and they're gonna promote Isles, uh, who is in OS uh, support from their academy team, who was pretty good, up to the main roster. So the reported new roster would be Summit, Blabber, Fudge, Zven, Isles. What are your thoughts on that? Your face kind of says it all, but I'd like the words. <laughs> that face also says quite a bit, too. <laughs> if you're not I watching on YouTube, I would like to Luke say that... I disagree with these decisions, Okay. and I don't think that their roster will perform anywhere near the level that they did mm -hmm. this last split, and I also don't think that was that impressive. So, mm -hmm. I Zach Mazur would agree with you. I do think it got worse, <laughs> yeah. so that's unfortunate to see. Um, it almost felt like we were talking about CLG. That's, I'm, be, I'm just gonna. I'm oh, gonna, don't worry. I'm, I'm just gonna be honest. I'm just gonna be honest with him, man. I'll be honest. That was that was that was. I'm, I don't think that was it. Yeah, yeah. I, for me, I felt like Zven was actually the weakest part of that roster last season. So I'm surprised to see that it appears that Zven will be returning. Um, granted, I, I think you could certainly make an argument that hey, there weren't. There wasn't an, an incredible wealth of 80 carry talent available. I think that's certainly an argument to be made, though. Maybe tactical is available. Lost appears to have been available for buyout. Um, so I think there were options, but maybe they feel like Zvet is the best bet there still. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the fudge <laughs> roll swap. Uh, yeah. I read, uh, I don't know if you saw LS's tweet, LS. LS's opinion was basically, if you don't like the role swap, you obviously haven't been watching Fudge closely enough. He basically was like, he's a mid laner playing in top lane. So uh, LS is a good analyst. And I think uh, I, while I disagree with LS on a lot of things, I'm willing to put a little faith in him here and say, okay, maybe, maybe this will work out okay. Um, I'll see a week I one of winners. Play. Yeah, I, I, I like the pickup of Summit for top lane to replace Fudge. The problem that I have is the fact that Niski was available from Fnatic. 
Mm. And obviously Niski was the combination with Blabber that really launched Blabber into the stratosphere of North American junglers. That combination was incredible in 2020, but it appears the hangup was that essentially Cloud9 was unwilling to pay any more to buy out Niski's contract from Fnatic than they got from Fnatic in his original buyout, which I believe was in the range of, I don't know if it's $300,000 or 300,000 euros. I think it's $300,000 that the original buyout was. Apparently, reportedly, Fnatic lowered the buyout down to 350K, and apparently that was still too much, which I think is fucking insane. I thought Niski and Blabber were incredible. And imagine you just, you know, okay, if you're gonna let Vulcan go, I think that's fine. I like, I like Isles. I think he's gonna perform really well in support. Imagine just running back the same roster with Fudge, Blabber's Ven, and just add Niski back, which you already know he has synergy, synergy with your jungler yeah. and has played with your AD carry. You've got a great young O support. Fudge was, like, by the end of the season, a top two top laner in the league, and you just go, hey, we're going to just run back this Niski-Blabber combo that was incredible a year ago, like, and 50 grand was, like, what stood in your way? Like, either you really, really wanted to move Fudge to mid and sign Summit, or you really let $50,000 for this multi-million dollar org get in the way of putting together what I thought would be a really good roster. Yeah, I can't disagree. You know, it's just, it's hard to see all the politics without yeah. knowing, you know, but either way, I don't, I can't say I'm a fan. So yeah. let's, let's, give me the CLG roster. Give it to me. Uh, so... <laughs> Let, before I give you the reported roster, I'll just say that, first of all, uh, here, here is what I wrote in my notes for CLG. I said, and I quote, release entire roster, parentheses, insert Bud Light Ace <laughs> meme here. <laughs> yeah, dude, that post was so brutal, man. Like, and I just love everybody re replying to it with, like, Bud Light Ace, Pentakill, all this stuff underneath that tweet was fantastic. Yeah, so they released their brutal, entire man. roster. Uh, I believe Finn is going back to EU. Don't know about Broxa, Demonte. Uh, Wild Turtle is being signed by another LCS team. Uh, I don't think Smoothie is going anywhere. But yeah, the entire roster has been released. I will see. Say, for CLG, what I have heard I actually do like. And this is coming from someone who has been a longtime CLG fan and was basically like, if you don't sign a roster I like in the summer or in the you know offseason of 2021, like I'm done with you. And I will say I am not done with CLG based on the reporting. Um, I love what they've done from a, a staff perspective, bringing ThinkCard in as a coach. I think ThinkCard is great. Uh, their new GM that they hired I think is awesome. Um, the current reported roster for CLG is Jenkins, which was the backup top laner for Team Liquid. Contracts, who was playing with CL, uh, with EG, I should say. Uh, I love Contracts. Palafox, Luger, and Poom. So that's a very young bottom side of the map with con and, and even your top laner with Contracts. So it's a very young roster with a veteran jungler. And honestly, like, do I think this is a top four roster? No. Is this a roster that I like and would like to see built upon? Yeah, this is the, the approach that I wished CLG had taken a year ago instead of basically signing a placeholder roster of a bunch of veterans that I don't care about. So, cool. Yeah. Go CLG. Yeah, I don't really, uh, I don't really have any thoughts really on the roster. You know, obviously, outside of the jungler itself, I don't really know the players too well. Yeah. Um, but... You know, I'm, I'm always about, you know, starting over. Yeah. You know, sometimes you just got to, you know, count your chickens before the eggs before the hatch. Yeah. I don't, whatever, insert, <laughs> insert whatever metaphor here. Um, and I think that it was, a, it was a good move for them to kind of uh, start from scratch here and try to, like you said, to kind of build on, yeah. you know, what could be a potential good skeleton. And maybe they just have a couple puzzle pieces they need to swap out. Three more LCS teams I want to talk about, but obviously we still have more to more to talk about. We are going to talk about Arcane here at the end of the show once again. So uh, I just kind of want to rattle through these last three yep. rosters let's speed before, let's speed uh, before we talk about our quick LEC point. Uh, let's start with Team Liquid. Uh, we discussed Team Liquid a little bit. The Brumers were maybe Bjergsen with a roll swap of Jensen to AD Carry. That is out. The reported TL roster is going to be Bwipo going from back from jungle back to top lane, signing him from Fnatic. Uh, Santorin will be back. They're signing Bjergsen. They're buying out Hansama from Rogue. 
and keeping Core JJ, though the caveat here is Core JJ's green card situation is apparently still pending. They are holding on to their academy support. If Core JJ can't play, they, it seems to be that they believe that they will sit Core JJ and keep the other two uh, imports in. What are your thoughts on that roster? I think it's sick too. <laughs> I'm like, are you I'm got a, Han Sama? I'm I, like, bro, that's. I know we're going fast here, so I'm just gonna give it a thumbs up. Yeah. I love the import in. Yeah. I think that's. I think that's the best move of the whole yeah. of the whole puzzle. And I hope that Core JJ can play because I think that's a very important piece of it as well. Because I think he carried a lot of the success they had. And I also just think Core JJ Han Sama is a disgusting Nasty. bot lane. I think that's incredible. Sign me in. So yes, TL approved. Sick. Uh, TSM. Their current reported roster is Hooney, Spica. That's it. Yeah, TSM screwed. Next. <laughs> like, no, uh, uh, apparently, they're maybe getting close to signing Mickey X from G2, which is that could be cool. Cool. Still no idea how the rest of the roster pans out. Maybe Tactical uh, has been talked about uh, completing that bot lane. I think that would be interesting. TSM's uh, got my, some work to do. I think the biggest question mark is mid lane. Yeah. DOE's gone. Bjergsen's gone. Yeah. I don't know what they're going to do there. They could go and try and sign, you know, somebody from the East. I mean, hey, TSM Chovy, I don't know. I mean, that'd, be, I mean, that'd be crazy. That'd be crazy. Who knows? I mean, you got that FTX money, TSM, yeah, make it happen. Call Mad Lines up. I, and I, I'm a CLG fan. Like, I hate TSM. And I'm over here like, bro, TSM Chovy be sick. Let's go. Yeah, uh, TSM needs to do something. I don't know yeah. what, but do something. Last LCS roster I want to talk about is actually Evil Geniuses. And I think this is... One of the most exciting new rosters, along with TL. They are reportedly running with Impact still in the top lane. Uh, they are buying out Inspired from Rogue, which is the reigning LEC Summer MVP. Jojo Pyun who is their uh, academy mid laner they are promoting. Uh, they have let Jizuke go. And then they're keeping Danny, and they are signing Vulcan from C9. Danny was wow. obviously like one of the big young revelations of last split uh jojo pion is one of the most hyped players outside of the lcs along impact with needs no, no introduction right and then you sign <laughs> like the needs best no, jungler from yeah. the lec it's just like this roster i looks like that roster. really cool like yeah. obviously you're leaning heavily on young talent with jojo pion and danny but i think danny has already shown he can compete with the best in the lcs and jojo pion i'm like hey if that's like the one question mark, I, I and you've got the kind of veteran talent you around you that can help you come up in the LCS. That's that's an exciting roster. I think that's a really cool team. We'll have to do some pickums or something like that for the for the next split. But um, I'm just gonna go out and say that I might be rooting for EG this year. Yeah. So that seems. We'll fun. definitely uh, maybe we'll do like a one to ten power rankings and yeah. we'll see how close we get. So we'll Sounds do that good. before the next split. Uh, very excited about that. God, I think. It was, you know, <laughs> with, uh, with a lot of the really well done reporting prior to free agency opening, there actually weren't really a ton of surprises yesterday. But with these rosters shaming up, it's definitely going to be an interesting split in the spring. The one thing we want to talk about in the LEC, we hinted uh, it earlier with perks, the LEC super team for next year is going to be Vitality. Their reported roster, Alfari. Obviously, the former Team Liquid top laner, Selfmade, who has already been playing for uh, for them, Perks, Karzy, and then they're keeping their support, Lebrov. That roster he, is insane. Because I think Selfmade is disgusting. Yeah, the whole that roster top is disgusting. side is gross. Yeah. You've got one of the best young talents at AD Carry and Karzy, like, dude. And now, granted, let's be clear. <clears throat> Super teams don't always work out. Roster allocation is a difficult problem to solve on teams like this. But I would say that Alfari made his name before he was the big beast carry, uh, you know, lane bully top laner he was of the last few years. He made his name as a weak side top laner on Origin back in the day, or on not on Origin, on uh, Misfits. So I think it can work. There's still, you know, even if you can make the resource allocation work, there's still like the personality issues and who wants to carry. But like, if this roster can play anywhere close to peak, when you just look at them on paper, dude, they will just body the LEC. And I cannot, I'd love to see this roster internationally. 
I'm all about it. I'm a big fan of super teams uh, <laughs> because, you know, it's, it's one of those things where they're either just so insane, they just eat everybody up, or they're just, like, so bad it's hilarious because yeah. they just massively failed. You so, you know, up. I feel like it's always a win-win when it comes to the Dream Squad. Sure. So. Tons of stuff there uh, for uh, all the roster news from League of Legends free agency. Obviously, if any big news moves happen over the next week, we'll talk about them on next week's episode. But let us know what you guys uh, are thinking about all of that. Now let's talk... Finally, about Arcane Act 2. Again, spoiler warning. Spoiler warning. Put it right here, Kyle. Wee, Just wee, give me a big wee, spoiler wee. warning. Some alarm bells. Whatever you need. Kyle, uh, put stuff in my hand. Arcane Act 2 <sighs> came out this weekend. We're going to talk about it. Final spoiler warning. Luke. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just giving Kyle a chance to do some graphics. Need, I want a Rasengan. If you do anything, give Luke a Rasengan there. <laughs> um, Act 2 came out. Yep. Midnight, yep. Saturday. Yep. What'd you think? Um, I liked it. I thought it was super cool. I liked that we did like a time skip into... Yep. Um, you know, everyone when they're a little bit older. Obviously, mm. getting to see Vi... Uh, captured or whatever. Yeah. And... Um, you know, the, the reunion between her and Jinx and all that stuff. Like, oh, overall, I thought it was super cool. Jinx is my favorite character now. Uh, I just love her. She, okay. was, she was so cool to watch. Yeah. And just, like, she's so crazy. And the animation of, like, her, like, split personality almost. Mm -hmm. Like, blowing my mind. Just when they were, like, you know, they're flashing her um, mm -hmm. her dead companions, lack of better terms. I'm sorry. Dude. Uh, I'm, I'm just sitting there. I'm all, Cause she, yeah. Oh man! I honestly, it was. I thought it was. I thought it was super fun to watch. I'm so excited for, because I felt like the first three episodes were like so intense and attention grabbing, and there's all these like crazy things going on. It was a crazy intro, especially yeah. when you compare it to what we got in Act Two. It was like, bro, they like really, really hit us over the head. Yes. Hit us for a ride in Act One. That's what I'm saying, and I feel like they took a big step back mm -hmm. in, in Act Two. So I'm expecting a step in in yeah. step in Act Three, and Act Three is going to be crazy because i don't yeah. know if you watched the preview for act three i haven't yet but uh there's a there's like a a, a clip where they show jace and vi mm -hmm. back to back with the gauntlet and the hammer and i literally am like give me act three <laughs> give it to me <laughs> like i'm like so ready for because it, it just looks so cool and I, I know there's gonna be a lot of action and great animation going into this next act and i'm really excited for that yeah um, but I, I i really loved the in-depth like story pathing of act two and really yeah. just showing you the um you know i think that the heimerdinger part was crazy you know it was so sad can we and can we talk about because i feel like this was a little bit of a discussion during act one talking about how they've animated heimerdinger and i feel like they totally blew it away with act two in terms of the fact that like heimerdinger you get to see his eyes and that's really it. And you see his mustache move, and that's really it. But the way that they've actually done such a good job translating emotion with his character just with his eyes, like the moment where they're voting him out of the council, and just you get that look at him where he's like, Jace, no. And I was just like, Heimerdinger, no! I was like, my heart broke. And I felt like they have just done there are so many things that we could just like laud them with a, a, a praise over, but I was very specifically torn apart by Heimerdinger's eyes in that scene. I thought it was incredible. I, I think even more than just that scene, right? Like the scene where he sees the Hextech core like activated for like the first yeah, time, yeah, yeah. and like he, he they, they like do a zoom in on his eyes, and you can see him like not only remembering back to a time where. Technolo technological advances essentially destroyed yeah. a lot of human lives, mm -hmm. but he can, you know, also have the foresight to see what's coming in the future. And yeah. if they don't, if he doesn't stop it now, that regardless of what good it might do, it's going to end countless human lives. And mm -hmm. he can, he can tell that for sure. I'm just so scared for the next episodes, man. Yeah. Like, I, I just know that there's going to be such massive tragedy because this is this is like foreshadowing 101 where it's like the dude with the giant brain who can like essentially, let's just say, critical think light years ahead of you yeah. is terrified of what he's seeing. And I mean, I don't know how much you guys know about Victor as a character in League. I'm going to say he doesn't look like a nice guy. 
okay? I'm serious. Granted, all the all the ladies on Twitter are simping for Victor hardcore right now. Like, I love it, too, because I think his character has been really good in the show so far, and he's been really interesting and really likable literally until the last episode. And I'm kind of now, like, because I, I don't know. It's probably because I, I know where this is going, but I'm just like, uh-oh. There's only one thing to simp for in the show, and it's Vi, okay? Dude. I'm simping so, for Vi and all of Vi's, Vi all of oh. Vi's sexual interactions oh. with every character. I'm a big fan of Vi's a hero. So, like, what a cool character! I think Luke and I can both agree, and I think a lot of you listening and watching will probably agree that our you know our, our hearts did a little flutter when when Vi kind of push Caitlyn against the wall there and we were just like my Jimmy's got Woo! rustled up bro and I was yes. I was ready for act three okay <laughs> I'm ready for Vi Caitlyn babies check also, me in also also the moment too when Vi is is leaving I love that like small little character moment where she walks by and then she stops and like looks back at Caitlyn and Caitlyn's like in the room with that other girl and you can see Caitlyn like smiling and enjoying herself I was like that was a cool little character moment I was like oh that's kind of sweet and I'm like she also kind of gay, and I'm like, good for her. <laughs> yeah, I honestly don't like Caitlyn that much. Really? Yeah, I mean, I think she's like, you know, she's just like that preppy little schoolgirl who's like just for doing sure. her thing, and she's like, she's obviously like not into the mold that she's in, and she's like always trying to like break out of it a little bit and stuff yeah. like that. But like, just in general, I'm just kind of like, she just she feels so out of touch, and I think that's like part of the goal as them showing that the piltover compared to the slums or mm -hmm. whatever it's called Zon, yeah, yeah it, the, the difference there obviously culturally like the ones in piltover like don't even like really get it mm -hmm. you know what i mean like they don't even like fully understand like the cultural impact yeah. you know vi's all she's all like what are we doing here and vi's just getting information and stuff you know yeah. what i mean like the whole underground vibes like so i don't know if it's one of those things where there's like a, a glow up coming where in the act three and you see like grown yeah. up caitlin who's like now all mature and understands and stuff like that so you know, I'm not, I'm not holding too much against her, but obviously my experience with Caitlyn so far has just kind of been like, do you even know what's going on? Like, I can think, you wake up, please? I think part of it, and I think what they're using, I think they're using Vi and Caitlyn very specifically for the same role on the opposing sides. And it's very specifically because you look at, and I think it's very easy to sympathize with the people of Zon because of what is going on and just hate Piltover. And I don't think that is like the wrong thing to do. But I think they're very specifically using Caitlyn and Vi to both find this middle ground in between the two. Because I think you can easily use Caitlyn as a, again, like kind of a, as you do there, like a surrogate for Piltover and for their ideals and the lack of caring about Zahn. And Vi is very much a surrogate for Zahn and the hatred for Piltover. And I think very specifically this relationship is going to be about finding that middle ground yeah. somewhere. Uh, so I, I think they fill, fill very same roles. It's just easy to sympathize and like Vi, I think, with the situation and what we've seen so far. Um, so Easter eggs then. Obviously, uh, Easter eggs for lack of better terms, but Deckard's definitely singed. Right? Wait. Oh, does, does he call him Deckard? Is that what he calls him? I think so, right? Because they Is definitely... That I heard was? that, and I haven't gone back and watched this, but I heard that literally... If you watch Act One with subtitles, they call his character Singed, like oh. the, the scientist with Silco. They, I believe they call him Singed. Like, well, when the, you see him in Act Two, you're like, oh, it's Singed. Yeah, and he, I mean, <laughs> even even in Act One, I like looked. I remember pausing at one point and I like Googled Singed splash art and I like looked at his splash art. I looked at him. I was like, that's the same dude. <laughs> that's the same guy. Uh, and so then what was the other? Definitely one? Oh. Singed. And then the owls. So Echo, right? Okay, I actually hadn't even considered me that. Me neither. Ryan told until me. Yeah. That's yes, okay, yeah. Yeah. So shout out to Ryan. Pointed that out. Well, I don't. I don't know that we've necessarily seen anything that like is fairly definitive. But at the same time, I'm like, well, we didn't see Echo. And I'm like, that would kind of make a lot of sense. Uh -huh. So I'm like, I could see him being part of the Firelight. Oh, me too. So 100. Um, I'm like, I'm like hard <laughs> sold because I was like, because Ryan was like, e did you see Echo? And I was all Echo. I was like. No. I didn't see Echo. I was like, what happened to Echo? I forgot. Then I was like, oh my god, the owls. <laughs> so I don't know. I think he might be one of the owls. And if that is the case, and that's super cool. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know. I guess I'm excited to see what happened. Like, it, it ended kind of like just. How about that last scene? I, I When I saw they kind of show, you know, Jinx up on the platform and she's like lit the, 
the flare or whatever, and you see Vi and kind of Caitlyn walk by, and Vi kind of notices it, but then keeps walking. And when I saw that, I was like, no, you've got to go see your sister. No. And then she went up there, I was like, thank yes. God. And then everything went to hell, and I was like, no. <laughs> that First of all, that last scene was incredible. I think the the way that they have displayed Jinx, and very specifically how that whole scene is built around, like, Jinx is like, are you even real? I'm not sure you're real. Obviously, she had, like, the hallucination with the the, other the, two. the pink uh, girl in the first episode where she thought that oh, was Vi and yeah, killed yeah, her. Yeah, yeah. So she's obviously very much struggling with, like, what is reality right now? And then having that moment where she doesn't even know if Vi is real, and now Vi has, like, disappeared, and now is she going to be like, you weren't real at that time or whatever? I think that is just, it's fascinating. I think Jinx's character is developing really well. Also, shout out to Silco. Mm. The more I watch this show, like, I hate the character, but I love the character. I think they've done him so well. The writing is great. The performance is incredible. I have thoroughly enjoyed Silco the more I watch of this show. Yeah, a lot of weird interactions. You're, like, watching, you're like, what is going on? But you're like, I don't even, I think I'm okay with it. I think it's cool. I don't know. It's like, okay. I, I'm just glad yeah. you know with the father-daughter relationship with Silco and Jinx. Because at first, I was like, I was like, I was like, are they going to kiss right yeah. now? I was like, that ain't it, Chief. Yeah. Don't. And they did. I was like, okay, cool. I was like, we're going with the father-daughter They're just like, thing. Thank you. I just, you know, I'm, I'm a huge comic book fan. Yeah. Right? And, the Har and Harley Quinn is such a unique mm -hmm. character that I like, I like so much because of like her you know just the the variety of personalities if you will that she has sure. and like her the the affection level that she shows to like all kinds of characters throughout the uh throughout the universe and obviously jinx is a hundred percent derived from the uh, yeah, harley yeah, quinn from inspired, some extent yeah. some kind of mm -hmm. inspiration components and you, i see so much of the similar character in her and i just love her um just her personality and, and the way that she carries herself i think it's i think it's so spot on for a character in her situation so big also fan. also big shout out for to riot for the easter egg of jinx in her workshop listening to get jinxed the song from the champions release it's just like vibe it to i was like i was like hey i know that song hell yeah like that was really cool um any other kind of just overall thoughts? Anything you're like specifically looking forward to? I know you mentioned that like Jason Vi moment. Anything else I, you yeah, want I'm, to hit on? Before? I'm definitely excited for some fight scenes, um, yes. and I'm very excited for um, the what you were talking about is that connection between um, Piltover and Z Zon. Yeah. Um, that whatever whatever that like connection is, and obviously it's the Jason Vi and Caitlyn and all of them like mm -hmm. are the are the front runners of that. Um, but, you know, Vi becoming an enforcer and all these things and actually being able to connect those two parts of the world. Um, I'm, I'm pretty excited for how they're going to run that through. Yeah. And they better not give my boy Heimerdinger the short end of the stick. He better come back with some big puff monsters mm -hmm. and, like, help out in the fight. So, yeah, uh, I, I think see it. they have very much set up, like, a few separate storylines in Act 1 that are inching closer together in act two and then everything feels like it's all going to converge in act three and i'm very excited about that um fuck jace hmm. jace Whoa. sucks Whoa. great character but just oh my like, god can we talk about the jace sex scene for a second dude what was, was going like, on dude act like, two was crazy was like, okay Ryan. Act two was crazy yeah and that scene was like like uh freaking victor's literally dying in the scene jace is having a time of his life and, and victor's all Bleh! like i'm all i'm all what is going on bro like help our boy out but yeah. overall i mean i'm really excited for act three yeah. um i think today's episode was an absolute blast and um what have you been playing uh so i just started dread shout out uh to luke uh for lending me his copy uh I barely started it. I got through the first two Emmy encounters. Um, Ooh, I guess my only stress, question right now is stress. like, why did you let me kill the first Emmy if you're just going to immediately take away my power? And I'm like, I'm pretty sure most of them I can't kill anyway and I have to avoid. So like, I thought that was a little weird, but it's like, it's whatever. It's, it's just, just a like a, it's a temporary it's a power where it's yeah. like, it's so, it's so like you need so much of a specific power to yeah. kill them that you can only sustain it for so long. Yeah, because I then, only shot the first one and then I had to run away from the second one. And I was like, you immediately ripped that away from me. I'm like, why even give it to me in the first place? Yeah. I'm like, but it's a, it's a uh, thing you'll see throughout the game. You kill sure, a bunch. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, but at the very least, the first part, really interesting. Uh, the game seems super cool. I love um, 
how they have very nicely stitched together the gameplay into the cutscenes seems very seamless and very cool. Um, so I love that so far. Um, so I've been playing that. Obviously, I've been playing a ton of Halo Infinite. Uh, we were talking about it before, but I got Plat 2 in ranked right now. Diamond is the goal. I think I can do it. So I'm super excited to grind Infinite. Also excited for Pokemon. Mm. BDSP, Brilliant Diamond, Shining Pearl. My first trip in the Sinnoh region, I'm super, so excited about. I mean, this, like, Sword was my first new Pokemon game for, like, a long time. And now I get to do that again in, like, such a short amount of time. So I'm, like, incredibly excited for that. I'm super excited for Pokemon also. That's also obviously coming out this week. So that'll be Diamond. I was My goal was to beat metroid dread before it came out and so you did it congrats i did i did beat metroid dread this week it was a super fun game would definitely recommend uh, you guys uh, doing a playthrough um i'm really excited for uh, pokemon diamond i'll be playing that um later this week as well make sure you guys tune into our friday live stream we'll be we'll be grinding some pokemon yep. um and other than that you know i need to play a little valorant here and there yep. um playing some games and obviously i've been jumping into infinite um infinite's been a good time uh, again it's been a while since i picked up a controller like i said earlier so i, I can't necessarily say that i've been absolutely crushing it but i feel like i've been i've been holding my own uh pretty fine in the halo infinite realm there was one game specifically where i was up against like a super sweaty four stack and i could feel it and they were just like all over me on the map yeah. and and i was like and i like r was running a clink on them i was like boom double kill boom triple kill. i was like insane i was like going for that i was going for the overkill and the dude just breaks my ankles and ninjas me bro <laughs> like and the thing is too is like and it, it hurt me mentally right yeah. where it's like he literally jumped and i was like no and like boom it hits me and like so first of all as a gamer you know you get ninja in halo it's like yeah. oh it's like massive disrespect and it just like laid in my chair for like 20 minutes so i didn't even play i'm just like you know and not only did it not only did i get ninja the game the game then made like an announcement that was like oh get ninja you hate to see that and i was all and i'm like it's like in the kill feed. It like Your says AI, in the yeah. kill feed, Shimon he got ninja. You hate to see it. And I'm literally, <laughs> and I'm, I'm like so massively destroyed mentally already because I just got ninja that the game didn't. Anyway, so I got scammed. Yeah. Um, and uh, other than that, it's been an absolute blast to play so far. A little glitchy for me specifically. It seems like a lot of other people as well had some, had some issues on their end. Mm -hmm. I know it's just the beta, uh, so it's hard to complain. Um, but overall, I have really really enjoyed my experience with that and i'm excited to keep gaming quick question then before we go what has been your favorite part of infinite so far what's like stood out to you the most hmm i'd say the, the ease of the game modes you know the yep. ui that kind of stuff like you get in you're just like you're in a party really easily you invite your friends you're like boom and then you're just like you want to play quick play playlist makes a lot of sense yep. fun to play no terrible things you're yep. just in there you're playing you want to play ranked Ranked arenas, boom, getting ranked arenas, playlist makes a lot of sense. You start with the, you know, the, the BR, you, um, you know, there's no mini map. It's just like, you can't, like we were talking about earlier, really, you can't ask for anything more than that. Yeah. So I would say what I've liked most about it is that it's a game that you can play and you don't have to immediately complain about every aspect of the game immediately. So I would and this say. This is coming from someone who loves to complain about it's every game aspect do. of the game. If you listen to the show, you know, it's what I do, <laughs> you know. But yeah, that's, uh, I'd say that's what I'm most excited about. Awesome. I really love, uh, I really love it too arenas starting with a br feels great i think they've done a really good job and i'm excited to see uh when we get the campaign on the a it's gonna be awesome but that's gonna do it folks 13 episodes in the books remember you can find us on soundcloud and apple Podcasts, as well as you can see our beautiful faces in the vod over on youtube so make sure to check that out we'll be back again next week with plenty more news make sure to check us out uh, on all of our socials lucas at shimona i'm at caster yeso and also check out esports arena over at esportsarena.com we got a ton of stuff coming up season four series e apex legends series e guilty gear and plenty more and as Luke mentioned, make sure to tune into our streams this week over at twitch.tv forward slash esports arena. Have a great rest of your week, folks. We'll see you again next time. Bye.